for a special program on a day when we are witnessing the transfer of power in the middle of a frankly terrifying cost of living crisis, which is on a scale not seen for decades. In terms of the cash she may have to spend to help, the immediate comparison is perhaps with Gordon Brown and the banking crash in 2007. But no one doubts the size of the challenge ahead. In the next few minutes, we're expecting the country's new leader, Liz Truss, to walk out of the famous door here behind me and make her first address to the country as prime minister. She starts her new job under extreme pressure to come up with swift answers to runaway inflation. And it's not just families who've waited patiently over the summer whilst the leadership contest played out. Businesses, schools, care homes and hospitals across Britain want to know what is the plan. We're told she has one and we expect it to be announced within days. Will it be enough to combat the crippling energy bills coming everyone's way? Well, this lunchtime, Liz Truss flew up to Balmoral, where she accepted the Queen's invitation to form a new government. The first time the request has been made there since Queen Victoria extended such an invitation to Lord Salisbury in 1885, if you follow your history. Fog at Aberdeen Airport delayed the meeting by 10 minutes, but as you can see, it went ahead. And before long, Liz Truss was racing back to London, where we await the first speech of her premiership, which we will bring you live. It is a big day, and much has already happened. We woke to the outgoing Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, signing off from his eventful tenure. He made it clear he thought the economy was in a strong enough state for the government to step in with more support for energy bills this winter. We have and will continue to have that economic strength to give people the cash they need to get through this energy crisis that has been caused by Putin's vicious war. And I know that Liz Truss and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis and this country will endure it and we will win. He was clapped out by colleagues and close family before leaving Downing Street after just under three years in office. Well, now the stage uh, is set, almost literally, it's not quite here yet, but it is set for the new Prime Minister Liz Truss to address the nation as we await details of her plan for the country. Well, as you would expect, on a big day like this, our, Robert, uh, our political editor Robert Peston is uh, right here beside me. Look, more than anything else today, people want to know what is she going to do on the cost of living crisis? And it does sound as if she has a plan. Yeah, I mean, uh, th there is a proposal which we may even get the detail of on Thursday, which is to spend not far of £100 billion putting a cap on uh, energy prices at the level that was set back in the spring. If you remember, that was just shy of £2,000. Yep plus the £400 handout that Rishi Sunak gave everybody for their bills uh, to sort of reduce the impact. So the, the new ceiling will be about £2,500 for households. There is also going to be help for businesses. Uh, and as you, know, you and I have I've discussed, uh, actually thousands of small businesses mm. are facing absolute catastrophe. Their bills are actually even higher than the extraordinary amounts that households are being expected to pay. But... That is much more complicated. I mean, let's be clear, it's a big sum of money helping households, and yeah. it's also quite complicated, yeah. but helping smaller businesses is very complicated because they all have individual deals. There isn't a price cap. Um, the companies that provide them do it in all sorts of different ways. So a simple scheme, I am told by people in the industry, of the sort that's being offered to households would be open to absolutely massive fraud and so the government does have to think very very carefully about how to provide that help and then on top of all of that because let's be absolutely clear mm. if the new cap is two and a half thousand mm. right and that holds for let's say 18 months that is still a massive increase mm. uh, the, for, for, for people compared to what people were paying, say, a year ago. Mm. And for those on low incomes, that is still going to be okay. very difficult. And so there's going to have to be other help as well, perhaps through universal credit. Look, for people watching yeah. this programme who are very worried about paying, yeah. uh, heating their homes and all the rest of it this winter, this is a big, big, big piece of news. It's right. a big piece of news. And it's I certainly at the upper end of the sorts of sums of money people were expecting, yeah. but it still is going to leave particularly people on low incomes, facing real difficulties. And is the Treasury's plan simply 
to add it to the debt and worry about it another day? Are we going to have to think about increasing taxes? How do you think, who ultimately is going to pay for this? Look, ultimately, since this is there, were, look, there, there was originally, as a result of a yeah. uh, suggestion from the industry, a thought about lending money to the companies, right? Mm. And then we'd all pay, that's households, would pay all that money back over 10, 20 yeah. years. But this trust has worked out that particularly two years ago before a general election, it's a bit of a political disaster because yeah. all debate will be about how they're pushing up bills for yeah. years to come. So yeah. it will be paid through uh, by the government yeah. uh, and it will initially be paid by borrowing, but borrowing is not a free lunch. I mean, yeah. there are only two ways that you can pay back borrowing. One is for the growth rate of the economy mm. to rise, which automatically leads to tax revenues mm. rising, yeah. which means that the burden of that debt gets less over time. Yeah. Liz Truss, her new uh, Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng say that's what they want to achieve. Yeah. But I've heard that from chancellors and leaders for donkeys years. We're yeah. going to get the growth rate up. Yeah. It hasn't happened in the past. We've got to hope it happens this time, but it hasn't happened in yeah. the past. So ultimately, there is a risk that when you shell out 100 billion pounds, taxes go up in the future. OK, there is so much to discuss. There's a lot of people waiting desperately to hear what she's uh, going to have to say, which we will bring to you, as we said, as soon as she comes out of this door and walks into the street. But just a few hours ago, Liz Truss was in Scotland, where the Queen asked her to form a government. In a break with the tradition, the meeting took place at Balmoral instead of Buckingham Palace due to the Queen's ongoing mobility issues. Uh, our royal editor, Chris Ship is outside Balmoral Castle. Uh, Chris, I guess much busier than usual at Balmoral today. Yes, Tom, in fact, I'm surprised that uh, Liz Truss is not with you yet. She left us here at Balmoral at about uh, one o'clock uh, this afternoon in what was an absolute uh, downpour here uh, in Aberdeenshire, perhaps a metaphor for the, some of the uh, the political storm that she's got ahead uh, coming in, in the coming weeks and months that you've just been talking to, uh, to, to Robert about. But, of course, this was very much uh, unusual uh, for Balmoral. Things like this don't normally happen in the summer because this is, of course, where the Queen comes to get away from it all. However, uh, the Prime Ministers came here this afternoon. First off was uh, Boris Johnson, who uh, came here late morning after 11 o'clock, stepped out of the car, met by the Queen's uh, private secretary, uh, and in he went uh, with his wife, Carrie Johnson, to tender his resignation, which Buckingham Palace said in a statement afterwards the Queen graciously uh, accepted. There was then this delay, um, having landed ourselves at Aberdeen Airport this morning, very misty. Liz Truss's plane wasn't able to land in the time that it was scheduled to do so and it meant that she got here um, you know 10 or 15 minutes later than scheduled just after midday uh, met the Queen she was asked uh, by the Queen if she could command the confidence of the House of Commons that is you know you know Tom you know your history it's uh, the, the Queen must always have a Prime Minister and that Prime Minister must be able to command the confidence of the House of Commons and then go on uh, to form a government and then uh, Liz Truss left here for the journey back to London at some point of course she will be with you and at some point she'll be setting out what her plan is as the Queen's 15th Prime Minister. Well, Chris, you mentioned that it's the 15th Prime Minister, and obviously one of the things we've all been pretty worried about, the Queen's health. In one sense, it's uh, encouraging to all of us that this meeting went ahead as far as we can see as normal. I know we always have this absolute fascination about the one thing we can't know about is that what takes place in that conversation between the Queen and her Prime Minister. But do you get any sense from past conversations? Will she have immediately wanted to step into the severity of the situation we're in? Will it have just been a fairly quick meet and greet? What's your sense of it? Well, look, Tom, the reason why it was happening here at all is because of the Queen's ongoing mobility issues. Buckingham Palace told us they wanted to put some certainty in the politician's diary so there wasn't any kind of last-minute change of plan. But, of course, it's all to do with the Queen's comfort and she was simply unable to travel as had been planned uh, to go to Buckingham Palace where these things normally happen. As you mentioned earlier on in the programme, um, you know, there have been previous Prime Ministers uh, appointed here by the monarch, Queen Victoria did it to uh, Lord Salisbury. In fact, Asquith had to go all the way down to the south of France to meet King Edward VII to be invited to form a government. So uh, this journey was not quite that arduous. But this meeting, this special relationship that the Queen has, uh, or the monarch has, with, with the Prime Minister is a very special one. It is very private. We never know what is spoken about in those meetings. Prime Ministers, even after they've left the office, uh, never talk about it. 
bar, maybe a, a little slip up every so often by David Cameron, if you remember, Tom. Uh, but, you know, the Queen is someone who follows uh, rigorously the news, the current affairs. She will know the challenges that, that Liz Truss uh, faces. You could argue that the monarch doesn't face the same cost of living crisis as millions of people across the country, but she will know what is coming down the track. And when you think about it, here you've got a monarch who's had 14 prime ministers before Liz Truss. She has seen crises come, she has seen crises go. And I think Liz Truss would have welcomed the Council of the Queen today. A conversation I think that Liz Truss would have found very useful to, to meet a monarch who's seen uh, politicians come and go so many times before in her 70-year reign. OK, Chris, well, thank you very much indeed. Well, here at Downing Street, we await our new Prime Minister on her way back from Balmoral via RAF Northelt. We're expecting to hear from her in the next half an hour or so. We'll bring you that in full and all the reaction after this break.
In the next few minutes, we are expecting to hear from the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, following the departure of Boris Johnson from Number 10 this morning. Both he and Liz Truss flew on separate jets to Scotland to see the Queen, where she formally asked the new Conservative leader to form a government. She is now on her way back from RAF Northolt to Westminster. Well, before he left Downing Street, the outgoing Prime Minister used his speech to call for unity. Thank you to everybody behind me in this building. Thank you to all of you in government. Uh, thank you to everybody who's helped look after me and my family over the last three years, including, including Dylan, the dog. And I just say to my party, if Dylan and Larry can put behind them their occasional difficulties, then so can the Conservative Party. Pleased to see Dylan and Larry featuring in the Prime Minister's departure speech. Entertaining as ever. Look, we think of these Prime Ministerial departments, they're so dramatic, aren't they? Margaret Thatcher shedding a tear, Theresa May shedding a tear, Gordon Brown walking down with his young sons and everyone saying, oh, why didn't we see this side of him before? What was your own impression of this morning? Uh, well, it was classic, Boris Johnson. Uh, ever since he was pushed out, there really hasn't been an apology or really a hint of regret or a sense that he did anything wrong and the same was true today. Uh, he uh, used the metaphor that he was in a relay race and that um, somehow the rules were changed <laughs> midway through his prime ministership. Yeah. Most would say actually what happened was that normal rules, which is you can't have a prime minister yeah. who's not trusted by his colleagues, were uh, applied. There was, nothing, there was nothing in the rules yeah. that changed. It was just that he broke the rules, people would but say. We shouldn't, but we, 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 we shouldn't lose sight of, I guess. I know we've talked about yeah. this a lot, but, you know, this is a man who won a huge... Yeah, you, know, yeah. you think of Cameron struggling and well, going into yeah, coalition because he we didn't... Talk, we, we talked about this last night. Yeah. It is a, it, look, his departure is extraordinary in that he won the biggest majority of a Tory party since the 1980s at a time when people thought it was almost impo impo impossible for any party to yeah. win that kind of majority, and he did it. You would normally expect, you know, and we said this on election night, somebody to win that big to mm. win, to be in power for at least two terms, right? It just goes to show people shouldn't <laughs> listen to us, well, but that's I'm a not, different... But, yeah. No, 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 but it you... just shows you, A, that he is so different from yeah. other politicians and he's also the other thing I want to say about his departure because it's in stark contrast with Liz Truss who we're about to hear from yeah. is the other reason he is different from his Tory colleagues is all the achievements he bigged up today were really about spending money roads rail all that money he spent mm. during Covid. Now, what we're going to hear from Liz Truss in a few minutes is that Tories are supposed to be about cutting taxes he put them out. They're supposed to be about shrinking the state. Mm. He's massively expanded it. He was not a typical Tory prime minister. And the other thing that he did, which I suppose you could say all prime ministers do, although he maybe does it more than most, is he also bigged up quite a lot of uh, uh, sort of alleged successes, which are, we might say, mm. work in progress. He claimed to have sorted out social care. Well, I think if we talk to those who know about social care, they yeah, would say different. there's a lot yet to okay. be done there. OK, one more point I think we, we, we have to mention is his reference to Cincinnatus. You know, if you're a classicist watching this, you'll know that uh, he was called back to be dictator of Rome from his farm and he fixed the problem, defeated an army and then went back to his farm. What do you make of that reference? Uh, have we look, seen the last of Boris Johnson in here, I guess, is the question. Uh, look, there are lots of Tory members, some Tory MPs, who think that they've made a terrible mistake in pushing him out. Um, we've seen, actually, across the Western world, uh, politicians, particularly populist politicians, mm. uh, you know, either making comeback, comebacks in the shape of, let's say, Berlusconi or promising mm. to make comebacks in the, face, in the yeah. case of Donald Trump. Uh, I think it's a foolish person who assumes that, uh, you know, Boris Johnson will simply return to, do, to domestic life uh, and not be terribly visible. Now, he does need to make money. Let's be absolutely... Clear. Uh, I mean, we know he ran up a big debt decorating the flag, which he ended up having to pay mm. for. Um, his divorce has apparently cost him quite a lot of money. He wants to make money, mm. and he'll make a lot of money with speeches, writing yeah. columns. Now, the big choice he's got, and actually this is a bit of an issue for, for um, Liz Truss, as an MP, 
the hundreds of thousands, probably millions that he'll mm. earn over the next year or two, he'll have to disclose in the members' register, uh, which his party probably, they probably won't enjoy that disclosure. Yeah. So basically, he's, in the end, at some point in the next year or two, got to make a decision about, is it about money or is it about politics? OK, fascinating choice. We await to see uh, what's happened. You may uh, be able to see behind me there is indeed the podium. It has been put out. So we are getting, uh, we are inching closer uh, to the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, coming uh, to give us uh, the benefit of her thoughts, particularly on the energy crisis, as we said, which is troubling so many people. Now, here is how the next few hours and days will play out after she makes that speech and then heads back inside number 10 to get to work. Tonight, she'll finalise her first cabinet. Some appointments have already been made. The new cabinet will meet for the first time tomorrow morning. Ms. Truss will then face Sakir Starmer at her first Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons. Then, on Thursday, she's expected to announce her plan for tackling the energy crisis. Now, as we wait uh, to hear from Ms. Truss, our UK editor, Paul Brand, is outside the Houses of Parliament, and he's joined by Paul Scully, the MP for Sutton and Cheam. Paul, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Tom, because the campaign slogan for Liz Truss was, in Liz we trust... But, of course, a minority of MPs actually backed her and a majority of the public, if you follow the polls, are yet to be convinced by her. So this speech this afternoon is going to be really pivotal in terms of not just speaking to her party now, but speaking to all of us as a country. And one of those who uh, was won over by Liz Truss during the course of that campaign is Paul Scully, uh, the local government minister who joins me now. Good afternoon to you and thanks for being here. So what do you think Liz Truss will focus on in this really key moment now this afternoon? As she said this morning, it's delivery, delivery, delivery. Uh, it's all about that now. We've got to, we, we've just got to crack on. There's two things I was looking for in a new leader. That was the ability to communicate what we're doing, what we're going to do, and the ability to actually crack on and deliver. Because we've had two and a half years with COVID, with war, with the, these build-up of the cost of living. We've now got, we're a government in a hurry to make sure that we can not only deliver on our manifestos, but deliver on the support that people need now on inflation and, I mean, and energy. You, you talk about communicating. Do you not think that's one of <coughs> Liz Truss's main weaknesses here, that she doesn't have that charisma, she doesn't have that natural communication skill? No, I think it's what we've seen is Liz absolutely grow into the role over the uh, eight weeks of the campaign. She's not a sort of, you know, performer, theatrical performer. She's not an orator like, like, like Boris Johnson. But I don't think people, that's what people are looking for now. People are looking for someone that street, um, speaks straight from the heart uh, and with a, that determination and clear language of what she wants to do and how she wants to go about doing it. I mean, maybe people are looking for that now, particularly during a cost of living crisis. They want to know what Liz Truss is going to do on energy bills. What should she do? So what we've seen is uh, throughout the campaign, she's spoken a lot about this. We've obviously got an announcement that, that you know, I understand is due over the next couple of days, mm. and we'll see what that is to behold. But what she's talked about is, first of all, having the principle of not taking money from people in taxes and what have you, just to give it back to them with a little patronising pat on the head. But so she's talked about all that. of the principles, but, but when it comes to the nitty-gritty, well, yeah, what has she got to do? Because then you've got lots of people that don't, don't pay tax, so that won't cover them. So you yeah. do need some direct intervention. now. Freezing energy prices? Well, th this is a possibility. This is something that I've seen tattered around. I don't have a speed dial to, to see what they've been discussing. But what I do know, when I was business minister for two and a half years, covering hospitality especially, the pressure that they were seeing with their increase of, uh, of energy bills is significant. And so we're going to have to look at everything that we can do to help them through this period. So it's going to have to apply to businesses as well, isn't it? It's certainly the approach that we've got to look at. New cabinet appointed this afternoon. Have you got your eye on any jobs in that cabinet? No, I'm just happy to do whatever I'm going to be doing. You know, so, so I, you know, my, my job is just to crack on and deliver. Really. Very modest, so. but she's going to have to build a cabinet of all the talents, yeah. isn't she? Because, Definitely. you know, the way that this campaign divided up amongst MPs was fairly evenly split. In the, in, the, in the final round of the three of them, it was kind of a third each in terms of the split of MPs. So she's going to have to put together a cabinet of unity, really, isn't she? You need people around her, especially in those key positions. I mean, it's really important that uh, the, the Chancellor's really in simpatico with her and aligned with her because you've got to get that relationship right. So you need a cabinet that is both well aligned, unified, but also got all the talent that of the, the party has to bear in that cabinet as well. So it's a difficult balance to strike, but I'm sure she'll do it. All right, Paul Scully, thanks so much for joining me this afternoon. So a really key speech, Tom, coming up in the next few moments. Uh, not just the country watching it, but of course everyone here in Westminster in Parliament too. I know Paul Scully has been anxious uh, to find out how he's going to watch it when it comes up in just a few minutes' time. But for now, back to you.
Okay, Paul, thank you very much indeed. Well, we've just been watching uh, live pictures of Liz Truss making her way as our new Prime Minister uh, home uh, to her new home, that is, in Downing Street for, from RAF Northolt. Uh, I guess every politician who comes to Westminster dreams of getting the call from the Queen to form a new government as Prime Minister. It is quite something, as we were discussing with Chris, nobody knows what to expect when you go into that uh, first meeting with the Queen. No one ever talks about it, no one ever has, and the detail of it is never revealed, but uh, she has been to Balmoral. She's had her first, but very definitely not her last conversation with the Queen. We don't know what words of advice the Queen uh, may have given her. Robert and I were just speculating whether she has been speeding on the way into central London on her enthusiasm to be here, but we're quite sure that that can't possibly be the case. Uh, but she is moving into Downing Street, as we've been discussing, at a time of really quite extreme crisis uh, in the country. Many people watching this program will be all too keenly and brutally aware of the energy crisis, of the danger of bills running out of control in a way most people simply uh, won't be able to pay. We've had a lot of speculation uh, about people having to choose between uh, eating and heating this winter uh, and many people who may uh, at times indeed not be able to do either. We're told that Liz Truss does now have, uh, as she makes her way into central London, to get to Downing Street to come out and make this speech uh, here on the podium. Uh, we're told she has a plan uh, and to say the very least, we're all very keen to hear it. Now, uh, you know, you'll see in Downing Street perhaps the podium is there, but it is very busy. There are hundreds and hundreds of journalists and camera uh, men and women from all over the world, but we also see uh, a lot of members of staff from the Cabinet Office uh, and so on who've come out uh, ready to await the new Prime Minister uh, and hear what she has to say. She's not the first Prime Minister, of course, to take office at a moment of crisis. Uh, we were thinking, we referenced Gordon Brown at the top who took over in the middle of the banking crash in 2007. Robert and I uh, were just talking about that, of course, uh, if the banks had been saved. That would arguably uh, have been an even worse crisis, but it certainly was severe. Uh, but for millions of people wondering how they're going to pay these bills, rarely has a speech by a new prime minister been so keenly anticipated. Now, to find out what people uh, do want to hear, what they're expecting to hear from Liz Truss, uh, our reporter Sangeeta Lal is in Birmingham. Sangeeta, over to you. Yep. We've been speaking to voters across Birmingham all day, not just about what they think of Liz Truss as their new Prime Minister, but what they're worried about and the concern coming up time and time again is that rising cost of fuel and rising energy bills. Now, I'm joined with Sharon, uh, Rosie and John. I know you all share this concern, but in different ways. Sharon, we'll start with you first because you're a carer. You've worked in the industry for more than two decades. A large part of your job involves driving to patients' homes. And I know you said that uh, the cost of filling up your tank has almost doubled from 40 to 50 pounds up to around 80 and 90 pounds and you mentioned that that has had an impact on your uh, staffing levels just tell me a little bit about that well with the increased rise of the fuel uh, a lot of staff are not able to to do the jobs that they're supposed to be doing because we're a domiciliary care base yeah it's all about going to services as homes and providing good quality care and they're having to say they want to change their jobs. Right, so almost being unable to afford their own careers that they've worked so hard to Correct. be part of and are passionate about that's and, and it. care about. And, and that's actually something that you emphasise with as well, Rosie, because you work in a, um, well, you own a um, not-for-profit organisation and social enterprise, which 100% of your profits go towards helping young people with complex needs get into employment. Mm -hmm. But you are also noticing the impacts of raising fuel and energy bills. Yeah, definitely. So. Our electricity costs used to be around about £700 per month. Um, just last month it was £3,200. Wow. So it's a huge impact yeah. on what we do and how much we can do. For me, I'd really like the Prime Minister to show that there's some support for small businesses and consumers. So I'd love to see a windfall tax on energy companies because yeah. they're making huge profits at the minute. Yeah, absolutely. And that's also something that you feel, John, we'll just come to you now because you have a startup online business which creates essentially a platform for artists yeah. to sell their work. But you're now saying that actually the rise of fuel and energy bills is meaning that artists that would normally come to you with work almost can't afford to do their own art anymore. Yeah, well, we're finding that a lot of artists, and this has been the case for a while, but it's obviously made worse by the crisis um, mm -hmm. is that artists have other work and in the creative industries more generally where people are freelancers they often have to look for other work which means they get squeezed on the amount of time they can spend on their art and yeah. then also um, when they do 
you know, managed to make money from their art. They're, they're not able to make a good living from it because everything's, um, you know, prices are rising. And we're expecting to hear from the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, soon. What do you hope she announces? I think as long as there's some degree of certainty that people can look into the future and see that things are uh, coming together and they know what they're going to be able to you know, plan for, yeah. um, I think that's going to be really important. Yeah. And just finally and quickly, um, do you have confidence that Liz Truss can do this? Do you have confidence in her as a Prime Minister? I think there's a huge amount that she's got to deal with. Yeah. The crisis in the NHS, rising fuel strikes. Yeah. It's a, it's a big task. Yeah, but a bit of hope. Definitely, yeah. Hope that we'll hear some announcements that might help your industries and your careers. Well, we are expecting to hear from the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, shortly, which I'm sure all of our guests will be waiting to hear and many more. Okay, Sangeeta, uh, thank you very much indeed. Well, we are m moments away uh, now from seeing the new Prime Minister, our new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, arrive uh, in Downing Street as she makes her way swiftly through central London. Uh, as we've discussed uh, already in the past half an hour, rarely has a new speech by a new Prime Minister or a first speech by a new Prime Minister been so keenly anticipated. We'll bring you her first words to the country live in just a few minutes after this break.
Well, welcome back. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time and wondering what on earth you're watching, a Range Rover uh, traveling along a street, uh, that is the new Prime Minister, our new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who's been up to Balmoral to be asked by the Queen uh, to form a government, making her way back here to number 10 Downing Street, where she is going to make her first speech as Prime Minister and, with any luck, give the nation some idea of how we're going to get through the cost of living and particularly the energy crisis. Robert has been speculating earlier she may be willing to spend up to £100 billion to get us through this winter. She is still some minutes away from Downing Street, but as soon as she's in the door here, we expect her to come out and address the nation. It's a packed street, it has to be said, something of an amphitheatre at moments like this, uh, not only because there are hundreds of press and camera here, but also because there are many officials uh, from Downing Street, from the Cabinet Office and from across Whitehall who have come in here uh, to hear what their new Prime Minister uh, is going to have to say. Well, Robert is right beside me, as you, would, uh, uh, as you probably will have seen by now. Robert, just out of interest, very notable that she and the departing Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, did not go up and down on the same plane, which they could have done. Was that just practicality? Was it just a bit awkward? Was it because he didn't want to or she didn't want to? What? Well, I'm going to answer that just to say, I'm just going to take an issue with one thing. I never speculate. I always report £100 billion. Yes, of, sorry, yes, yes, yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, of support sorry. for people. I withdraw the speculate energy. unreservedly. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's what we call reporting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, on the plane thing, I mean, look, just think about it mm. for a second. Um, first of all, it's a really emotional moment for yeah. Boris Johnson. You know, that, 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 that uh, transfer of power made by Her Majesty the Queen uh, in both directions, you know, both getting it in the first place and now giving it away. It's an incredibly big moment mm. in his life. And he will have wanted the build-up, the journey, to have been a private uh, matter with him and Mrs Johnson, Carrie yeah. Johnson. So I, I can understand it from his point of view. Yeah. And secondly, she has got an enormous amount of work to put together a cabinet, so many, we've talked about some of them, the energy yeah. crisis, health crisis, and the list goes on and on. She's yeah. got so many problems. She also doesn't really have the luxury of traveling up with a prime minister and having a sort of friendly chat on the way up. She's just got to work. So although I know some people have said it's a terrible waste of money, they travel separately, and I get the, yeah. you know, you know, we don't have bottomless purses. I do sort of understand why no, they no, went sure, in separate places. It seems to me that we know more about her cabinet already, potentially, than any prime minister I can remember. What's your sense of who's going to be in what job or what we already know? So, so like uh, most potential prime ministers, she wants people in the very top jobs to be people who are close to her, uh, who are allies, who are friends. And so one of the things that's very striking, um, the deputy prime minister, Therese Coffey, also likely to be health secretary. There is literally no MP closer to Liz mm. Truss than Therese Coffey. They have been a double act for years and years and years. Friends, allies. James Cleverley is going to be uh, going to be Foreign Secretary. They formed a very close relationship. She's Foreign Secretary. He yeah. was in the cabinet. Uh, sorry, say he was in the Foreign Office with her. He's currently Education Secretary. But before that, he was working with her in the Foreign Office. Again, a very close relationship. And quasi quarte. Mm. Again, they have been allies for years and years and years. I think he really respects her. I think that this he's going to be Chancellor, uh, and he sort of agrees with her that the so we might talk about this a bit later if you like but this so-called treasury orthodoxy is yeah. something she wants to challenge it's something he wants to challenge he wants to run the economy differently there are some economists who fear they're taking excessive risks with what with what mm. they're planning to do but to be um clear it will feel like a new uh, you know a, a new way of managing the economy and then with the other jobs she has got in a sense, obligations to me. Mm. So everybody assumed when Kemi Badnock, yeah. uh, who has never been in the cabinet, did so well during the MPs round of the yeah. leadership contest, she would have to have a decent job. Trust is not an idiotic politician. She's not given Kemi, or she's not giving Kemi Badnock a role that means she'll be on our screens the whole time. She doesn't want a challenge from mm. somebody who was already challenging her. So, but she's going to be given an important job of trade, which is, in terms of the prosperity of this country, okay. important. And then very, and, and I was just going to say, Penny Morden, as you know, yeah. who came 
third in the leadership race. She'll be leader of the House, which is an important job, but again, not one that will see her in much contact with the public. Well, it's just to give um, everyone sitting at home yeah. some context. What you're looking at is, of course, uh, the scene here in the street. Uh, hundreds of people here now waiting for the Prime Minister, presumably to cheer her in. Uh, we will get out the way, of course, to ensure we're not run over. And we can see, some, we can see some, some people who are going to be members of her yeah. team. There, Nadim Zahawi, well, yeah. who we think is going to be the sort of Cabinet Office fixer for her. Yeah. He's right in the front row there. Ben Wallace, who did come out and support her belatedly, he's going to yeah, stay as Defence Secretary. Secretary. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as you say, this is the traditional thing that happens when a Prime Minister's on their yeah. way. The now, listen, you yeah. know, you've given us a pen portrait of a team. What about, you know, Liz Truss herself? I mean, I did a charity thing once called Turn the Tables when a leading politician interviews a, a journalist. Uh, and and she interviewed to, you, did she? Yeah, she did, and she absolutely what, what ripped me like? to bits. <laughs> well, she was very funny, and um, I mean, I'm an easy target, you might argue, but she was very, very funny, and I thought, actually, you know, she's got a wit to her. What's your, what's your quick pen portrait of Liz Truss? So, she is, so there is this sort of paradox there, as you say, mm. that privately she can be very funny. Funny, I was at a drinks party, I don't know, um, actually at the last Tory conference. So yeah. I can't remember, we were talking about Europe, and, the first, and she just said, Robert, you're a walking cliche, which yeah. I have to say, I mean, did yeah. make, did make yeah. me laugh a bit. Uh, uh, and, and I think in general, if you talk to her colleagues privately, she can be very funny. She also does put people on the spot. I mean, I don't know if you heard this thing, but her dad's a maths professor, and alleged she likes to test out colleagues and officials to find out how good their mental arithmetic is, and she throws. I'm sure you would do very well. I hope it doesn't. <laughs> well, I'm interested. I hope it doesn't. I, I mean, it's, it's just See if, she ever, if she ever tries me with any, yeah, of, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. with any of that. So there is, given that actually her public performances on the podium are yeah. not that relaxed. I mean, Boris Johnson, who we saw here this morning, is always very relaxed at the podium. She's yeah. not that relaxed. Yeah. But she can be more fun and more relaxed in private. OK, I'm just going to say I back your mental arithmetic over mine, but that's really the subject of another, of another conversation. <laughs> It's a difficult speech, this, isn't it? You come out, first prime minister, expectations huge. Do you go for the big picture? Do you make a statement that's going to stand the test of history? Does she give us some of that detail on the energy crisis? Because that's what everyone wants to hear. What's your best guess about you know, what she will say? So the, the best crafted speech that I remember here, interestingly, mm. was that given by Theresa May, <laughs> which was genuinely quite an impressive vision for how she saw the future of Britain. Mm. And then almost none of that happened because her whole term in office was hijacked by the rows over Brexit. Um, uh, now, my guess is that, uh, uh, that Liz Truss will do some vision stuff. She is, she, she's, she's portrayed herself throughout the leadership contest as a traditional, fairly old-fashioned Tory, low taxes, smaller states, doing things more efficiently, encouraging the private sector. Mm. The big thing that she wants to do, again, we talked about this earlier, in the she wants to get the growth rate mm. of the country up. I, I was very struck the other day she gave an interview, and you don't hear this even from, you know, mm. you know even from Tory politicians on the right that often now. She gave a defence of giving money back through the tax system to rich people because she said it was more important to her that the economy grows than taking money from the rich. And she wanted to get away from what she regards as a sort of Labour socialist view that you've got to take from the rich all the time. Right? And she thinks yeah. she, she actually also encouraged the rich, interestingly. So she is a much more, as I say, traditional uh, Tory than we've seen for a long time. And I imagine we will get quite a lot of that. But she's also going to have to talk about this energy crisis, the, uh, you know, the catastrophe that many people on lower incomes are facing, unable to pay their bills, having to make a choice between heating and eating. And she's going to have to... She won't give us the detail, but she will pledge again that she will do what it takes to end the, you know, what will be personal tragedies if she doesn't act for, for hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people. And I know this is a trivial point, yeah. and you know, we're looking at Downing Street now, but we've just been watching the car coming in. Do you think the speech is like written ages ago? She absolutely knows it, or I mean, is she on, in the car you know, talking to members of her cabinet, or is in that, in that final 10 minutes as she comes in here, is she kind of right, OK, I get this speech is important, I've got to get the tone right, I'm thinking over and over it again? Look, as a leader, uh, there is a balance to be drawn between getting it absolutely mm -hmm. right and hubris. 
So although she will have been thinking, because it became clear a few weeks ago that she was going to win this contest, she'll have been thinking about the building blocks of it for a mm. few weeks. But my guess is, and this is a guess, this is, to use a phrase mm, yeah. that I dissed you for earlier, speculation. speculation. This is speculation. We don't my speculate, guess Robert. is that the finishing touches <laughs> will, will have been made over the last 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, uh, because, as I say, she didn't want to take anything for granted. Uh, and equally, she's also... I mean, look, you'll know this from the kind of work that we do. The moment is so important, and you can't get the moment right unless you make the finishing touches right at the end and you think about the mood of the country and the mood of the party you've inherited. Also, I guess this moment, I mean, like you think of kind of, I mean, I don't know what are the other comparisons one springs to mind, David Cameron and Nick Clegg in the Rose Garden, that moment where you really feel like the country is listening. The country is probably going to be listening today. You know, to some extent, people may have been a bit switched off about politics, yeah. you, know, you know, the endless scandal, changing leaders every yeah. five minutes. This yeah. is her moment, right? She's got to connect. She does. I mean, it has to be said that Cameron and Clegg yeah. was an absolutely enormous moment because we'd had Labour in power at that point since 1997 yeah. for 13 years. We hadn't seen a coalition government, uh, yeah. well, none, not in our lifetimes. Um, and so that really was a huge change. It will be very interesting to see how engaged the public are mm. because, you know, we've had a lot of Tory prime ministers over the last few years and for some people it's another prime minister coming along it's another bus coming along so i i, I you know she, she will have to energize people she will have to create a moment but the backdrop frankly is not okay. as 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 good as okay. it has been for previous one more leaders. thing to ask yep. you you've covered politics for most of your very long career you know we look at the polls <laughs> very you know, long. We, yeah, yeah we both covered politics for a very long time we we look at the polls. I know we're both pretty skeptical about polls. Sometimes they're accurate, sometimes they're not. The Tories are down at 30, 31 percent, been there for a while. Yeah. It's been a long time since they've been in that yeah. position. Is this, is your hunch, is your instinct that this is recoverable for the Tory party? Oh, God, it's, I mean, if you've seen the volatil volatility in politics in yeah. recent years, of course it's recoverable. It, a huge amount will depend on this energy plan yeah. that she is still scheduled to announce on Thursday. If she gets it right, if the British people feel that yeah. she understands their pain and is doing the right thing to sort it, then yeah. I think there will be a very significant bounce. If she mucks it up, yeah. if it looks, uh, you know, ill thought through, yeah. then to be uh, completely clear, uh, the, the, just... the, you know, they will be in real, they will, she will be in real trouble. If you're, uh, if you're wondering this, watching this and wondering what we're doing, oh, uh, we're, we're putting up <laughs> we're some brollies we're, we're because to put up, but, uh, oh, yeah. it's not like quite Wimbledon on a rainy day, <laughs> uh, but it is, uh, it is raining here in Downing uh, Street. Uh, so this is, this is a metaphor for what she does not, not want, want to happen yeah, when yeah, she announces yeah, her yeah, energy yeah, plan. Yeah, yeah. She wants the sun to come out when she yeah, announces yeah. her energy plan, which as is, opposed to what's happening to us Which it right may now. do. I mean, come, it's, well, it's slightly, it's slightly dark overhead and all the rest of it. Also, she's got a bit of a logistical problem if it buckets it down because there's hundreds of people out here and yeah. a, an error of some expectation yeah. I think is yeah. fair to say and yeah. she might have to deliver it inside uh, on the altar kit, or, which or, is not or, quite or the same I thing think, at all. Or, or I would quite like, because it's not happened before, I would quite like one of our loyal ministers to come out with an umbrella <laughs> and just stand there. Yeah. One, of those things you, yeah, one, of those things, one of those things you perhaps never quite recover from. Well, if you're watching all this, um, uh, here we are in a rainy Downing Street, Robert and I, you are watching the live shot of the Prime Minister uh, travelling in from Northolt. She has been up to Scotland to be asked by the Queen to form a government. Uh, on one side of your screen there, you were looking at the podium uh, a short minute ago, uh, which is where she is due to come out very shortly, we're told. I think realistically about another five, um, possibly ten minutes or so. Uh, and she's going to come out there and give her first address to the nation uh, as Prime Minister. And as we've been uh, discussing with Robert, she has one heck of an in-tray. We've talked a lot about the energy crisis. Uh, we've talked a lot about the economy. And actually, Robert, there's one thing I, I just want to ask you about that, um, which comes to mind. Yeah, we've talked about what she might do, the yeah. 100 billion, or what you, you know, say she's going to do. Yep. Do you think that will bring down inflationary pressure or not? Because obviously, you know, there's a bigger right. concern about inflation. All right, so just to be absolutely clear, yeah. okay, in the short term, yeah. by definition, 
right? Uh, you know, the, the Office of National Statistics, which decides inflation, will look at the price of energy uh, and it yeah. will, you know, not rise in the way that it might have done otherwise. So, of course, in the short term, yeah. uh, it will reduce inflation. Or inflation will not. Inflation is high. It yeah. is still rising. It is still going to rise because of what's happening, for example, the price of food and other uh, absolutely essential to our way of life. It is still yeah. going to. It's still a rising trend, but it won't rise as fast as, for example, the Bank of England was fearing yeah. it would rise. But we are in a sort of extraordinary time here. Normally, in history, inflation rises when growth is too fast. We yeah. have got this extraordinary situation where the economy is stagnating. We have got shortages of people. We've got shortages of some important goods and services. So inflation is being driven up, OK? Mm at a time when there's very little capacity, what's called capacity in the economy. And the worry about a stimulus of that level is when there's a shortage of capacity, it may not have a first order effect on inflation, but frankly, uh, if people start to spend again in a way, uh, then actually it could have a knock on to inflation. And it could mean that, in, that the Bank of England feels obliged to, to raise interest rates more than they otherwise would have done. Now, to be clear, my very clear sense of where Kwasi Kwasi, who's going to be Chancellor and, and Liz Charles are in there thinking about all of this is they think that it is less bad for them for interest rates to go up than it would be, and I think they're right about this, to have hundreds of thousands, millions of people in dire poverty this winter. Uh, so they are making a judgment that helping those people matters first. And if interest rates go up, it's not nice for, 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 for millions of people, but that is a second order problem, as it were. How worried do you think Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng will be about inflation over the next six months to a year? I mean, do they They've feel... Some... Of course, they're desperately, they're desperately worried about it. Um, they are trying to persuade themselves yeah. that there are sort of, in a sense, natural forces that will eventually lead prices to fall, and to an extent they are right. The, the more you go into recession, the less demand there is. It's very yeah. painful for all of us. Yeah. Actually, in the end, you know, prices do go in the opposite direction. But, as I said to you, we are in this extraordinary position where, despite the fact the economy is not going, there is not a lot of spare capacity in the economy, mm. and therefore inflation could persist for longer than any of us would like, including them. OK, well, um, you can probably hear the rain is falling here. We're not quite sure if it's a brief shower or not. Uh, not quite the auspicious start that Liz Truss was looking for as Prime Minister, still making her way from Northolt through central London to here. Uh, the podium, as you see, the microphones are now covered in plastic, uh, which is not a great sign. Quite honestly, if it's raining like this, it's hard uh, to see uh, her coming out and attempting to make a speech right. in, in this. Fact, in fact, they are in fact uh, they moving are in fact the lectern because they the don't lectern. want it damaged. Yes, so they there you don't go. Want, um, they don't want to damage may, it. They may, I think they we may remove that. it again. This is, um, this is, uh, this is certainly not uh, what the Prime Minister wanted. I think we should be reasonably clear that had, had, had it happened on time, just after four o'clock, uh, then things would have been, it would have been perfect. They would have been fine. But it's been difficult up there in Aberdeen, as I understand it. We were talking to Chris earlier about that meeting with the Queen, but there's been a lot of problems with fog, so it was difficult getting the planes in and out. Uh, as I understand it, that's what, uh, it's the reason why she's late uh, and the reason why she's struggling to get back into central London in time. But she's not here yet. Uh, it is raining very, very hard in Downing oh. Street uh, right now. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's a lot of laughter going on in the uh, press ranks and uh, us telly guys standing out here uh, in an umbrella. Um, but uh, oh, we God. are still waiting uh, for the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, to turn up. Uh, and we're going to see where, if ever, she might address us. And I don't know, um, I, think, I think it would be quite good if we could get, I think, our camera on the poor ministers who are... Yeah, this is... Uh, this is who this are is, all really... Yeah. Oh, my goodness. This is, as, Robert, as Robert is pointing this out... Is not, uh, this is not uh, how you want to welcome yeah, your new Liz, boss, is Liz, Liz Truss's uh, cabinet and staff, uh, you can probably see them over there uh, standing under umbrellas trying to stay dry... Uh, as they await for their new leader, uh, the police uh, men and women not quite so lucky in the. Uh, but I think the thing we should dubious. say, yeah, it's very British. It is very <laughs> British. Well, you can say that. This is about as British uh, as you get. Uh, a new prime minister in the driving rain, and it's still summertime. <laughs>
Uh, after the summer, we've had, you may say, that Liz Truss might feel a bit hacked off that her new premiership is coinciding Although with the we rain. we need the rain. We do need the rain. We do need the rain. We do need... Well, anyway, look, Robert and I are enjoying it. Um, uh, we're not quite so yet, but I'm sure we will be. So there we are, the aerial uh, shot you're seeing there. You've got the aerial on one side of the screen, Downing Street, a very rainy Downing Street on the other. Okay. Uh, there is every possibility. And I think we can see, actually, they have actually given up. OK, <laughs> the cabinet there's a limit to the amount of uh, I can see the <laughs> of BBC pulling faces with. at us. The other side as the cabinet disappear in, quite understandably. Uh, they have given up the ghost and, and gone back inside. Um, so I guess we're not quite sure. I mean, but I presume that means she's just going to give the speech inside, right? I mean, she's got. I think it's. Oh, look, I mean, looking in that direction, actually, yeah, it's it looks clearing clear. up. I mean, it could it could clear up in five or ten minutes. And if I were her, I would I do would it wait. outside if it was dry. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, they yeah. always look. The fact is, this is such an important moment of theatre for any prime yeah. minister. And I think if this party's over, which I think is a good chance. I mean, if I were her, I'd bring the lectern back out again and just. Do it yeah, when she's here, yeah. um, and you know the truth is she couldn't have done it now because you know she's yeah. still in the car. No, no, indeed, 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 indeed. Um, and Robert makes an important point there. You know, this is uh, partly about policy. We've talked. You know, sometimes prime ministers take office. You think of Theresa May taking office in the middle of Brexit. She had important things to say about the direction of that, how she was going to get Brexit done and all the rest of it. That was very important for healing her party, which had been very divided over Brexit. Um, you've then got, um, uh, you know, uh, Boris Johnson coming in. Uh, him having to deal with Brexit again, all over again. So it's an important moment of theatre in which Prime Ministers have to make a point. Um, now, Paul Brand is outside the Houses of Parliament. Maybe it's not raining there. He has Tobias Elwood, no fan of Boris Johnson, obviously. Look, Paul, over to you. up. Yeah, Tom, I'm absolutely soaked outside Parliament, actually. I think it's worse here than it is where you are, because we've got very little shelter, apart from, uh, thankfully, some umbrellas. But I'm here with Tobias Elwood, who's the Conservative MP for Bournemouth East. And uh, he uh, backed Penny Morden, didn't you, Tobias? Good afternoon to I you. Did, originally. So obviously not uh, necessarily Liz Truss back at, to begin with, but what are you looking for from her this afternoon in order to win you over? It's uh, going to be a challenging uh, couple of years until the next general election. We need to, the party to unite. We need to make sure that everybody's supporting Liz Truss. And then she needs to demonstrate to the nation that we've got the command, the authority to deal with the short-term issue of getting us through what will be a very difficult winter and then a longer-term plan to deal with the economic headwinds that we're going to face. For me personally, I want to see the commitment, which we started to see during the, camp the contest itself, to lean into Ukraine, to stand up to Russia, to actually make sure that Putin recognises that now that we're through this leadership contest, that we are a nation to contend with and we're willing to lead other nations as well. I mean, foreign policy, to some extent, is a strong point because, of course, she has just been foreign secretary. But it's domestic policy, isn't it, that's the real jeopardy for her now. What do you think she needs to do on energy prices? Well, let me actually conflate the two, if you like, because... They are related, of course. The fact that oil and gas prices are going up is because of what's going on in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Because we can't get those grain ships out of Odessa to the scale that we need to, food prices are going up here. So, again, I go back to the point. Security and our economy are intertwined. We understand that, we lean into it, we stand up to Russia, it will affect what's going on here. And we didn't hear a lot of that during the leadership contest itself. I hope that now we're going to hear that today. For people worried about paying their bills though, what do you think she should do, freeze them? Well, I'm not going to try and guess the policy which is going to be chosen in the next couple of days. I know that I mean, Why not? Everyone else is having to guess, aren't they? We've well, waited all summer for a policy on energy from this Potentially, government. but that's not what I do. What I want to know is that there are people, such as Nadim Sahawi, that have spent the summer working up those various options so the Prime Minister can make a quick decision. The nation, the nation is impatient mm -hmm. for us to get back to work. It's been a difficult summer. It's been bruising for the Conservative brand. It, we've been distracted by many of the issues, not getting on with them. Now we not only need to show that we've got those, uh, the actual solutions themselves, but our, the ability to actually implement them uh, so the nation can see that. Looking at unity in the party now, because this has been quite a divisive campaign, hasn't it, at times, particularly the last race uh, between Rishi Sunak and, and Liz Truss, the final round there was pretty vicious at moments. How does she bring the party together now? Because it doesn't look as though she's going to appoint a cabinet uh, of many different wings. It looks as though they'll mostly be her own supporters. You know, a common theme, I don't know where it came from during this campaign, was for all candidates, not just Liz Truss, but to sort of express their inner Maggie, if I can put it that way. 
Now, you can remember, I grew up with this. You had Ken Clark and Michael Heseltine on one side, and then you had Norman Tebbit and Nigel Lawson on the other. You had big beasts from right across the party, and the nation saw that. So Margaret Thatcher was willing to have discussions, robust discussions in the cabinet room. That's what I'd like to get back to, not just loyalists around the table. A serious debate. All right, Tobias Owens, I'm sure there'll be plenty of debates uh, going forward. And Liz Truss is going to spark those debates when she's due to give that speech in the next few minutes. Right, Tom? That is indeed right, Paul. And as you can see, Robert and I have got rid of our umbrellas. Uh, I won't quite go as far as to say the sun is shining here in Downing Street, but it has stopped raining momentarily. Uh, it's wonderful. Members of the Cabinet Office are, are coming back out, having scurried for cover. Uh, we're told that Liz Truss, uh, the new Prime Minister, is on the embankment. If you know your central London geography, you'll know that that is merely a stone's throw away from Downing Street. So we expect somewhat late, somewhat damp uh, in Downing Street, but we expect the Prime Minister to sweep in here uh, to the enthusiastic reception uh, of her loyal uh, supporters. Now, the Cabinet, we probably were watching just now when the Cabinet disappeared outside, and as you can see, here comes the pro podium. There's a bit of a cheer from the, uh, from the waiting press. Um, they're going to have to connect that out, and various Downing Street officials uh, are coming out behind it to take up their positions. So, uh, as Robert said, um, they are taking the opportunity to seize this moment, to create a bit of theatre, to come out and address the country uh, about the incredibly important uh, energy crisis and what she's going to do about it, and perhaps capture a sense of what her premiership uh, is going to be about. Uh, Robert, you were quite right. Say again? I said you were quite right, always right, but you know, they'll take the chance to come no, no, out no, no, here. No, I mean, no, no, no. I mean look, it, 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 it would just send the wrong signal to be put off by yeah. a spot of British well, I'm right. very, imp enough, I'm very yeah. impressed that the person who's going to be the second most powerful member of the government, uh, Therese Coffey, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, got, you know, didn't go under an umbrella yeah, for a while. She's yeah, looking yeah, a bit damp, but yeah, there you are. Yeah, it's very yeah, British, she, just yeah. to brave you the elements probably, and yeah, get yeah, on so with could, it. Yeah, you can probably see her standing uh, next to the police officers uh, over there. Uh, it's quite a dramatic. I mean, I suppose one of the things that's always tricky about these situations, isn't it, is for the country, you know, you sort of get used to one cabinet and you might vaguely know who they are and then it's all changed. A lot of these people are really, un they may not be unknown to you and I, but they certainly are uh, to the public. Yeah, there are going to be a number of members of the cabinet, people like Kit Malthouse, for example, even Kemi Badenoch, who, did, who you know, yeah. came to prominence during the leadership campaign, but until then nobody had heard of her. Going to be lots and lots of new names in important jobs. Quasi Kwarteng, business yeah. secretary, frankly, very few people know who the business secretary is. Yeah. He's now chancellor, the most important job, or will be any, any time, any, any moment now, he'll be chancellor, the second most important job in mm. the government. So you're right. Um, you know, lots for all of us to learn. I was thinking about this today, actually. Um, it's quite unsettling, actually. I mean, it's mm. particularly unsettling if you do my job, because yeah. uh, you spend your life trying to get to know people, yeah, and then it turns out they're, you yeah. know... How dare they? They've gone, yeah. You know, they've gone, some of them leave Parliament forever. Yeah. You, thought, you thought, what was the point of building up that yeah, relationship? Yeah, so you've got yeah, to build up yeah, some yeah, new, yeah. get to know some new people, persuade them to tell you things they shouldn't. Yeah. Um, but for the country as a whole, actually, if you look across the world, Mm. OK, stability in government is normally associated with prosperity mm. and systems where there is tremendous, tremendous unpredictability about who's going to be in power, what their policies are. That kind of uncertainty is actually normally associated with lower growth, lower productivity, which is the amount that everybody produces. And it sort of means as a country you're likely to be poorer. I mean, for years, yeah. You know, uh, British politicians said, oh, we're never going to be like Italy, where they seem to change yeah. governments every six months. Well, actually, in many ways, and, you know, and Italy was regarded as one of the poorest performing economies in, in you know, Europe for a long time. Look, our, our, our ability to hang on to prime ministers is pretty much as bad as Italy's has been. Yeah, the only thing I, the only thing I would say, and I, you know, I'm just told the prime minister is now very close, so she'll be sweeping up here any minute, but yeah. just before she arrives, I, the only thing I... I've, you know, we've we've talked a lot. You know, you and I have talked a lot on air. We've talked a lot off air about the things that you know seem particularly worrying about the threats to global democracy and all the rest of it. One thing that has struck me about all this, yeah. you know, in America in the last election, we discovered the weaknesses in the U.S. electoral system. Yeah. You know, there is nothing in the U.S. Constitution that says that the electoral college has to be decided by popular vote, and there did seem to have been genuine attempts uh, to overthrow that election. Now. Here, what we've seen is, in a way, a sense of the strength of the Westminster system. Oh, no, right? totally. You, know, you no, vote no, for no, your no, MP, no, 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 your MP yeah. has this power. 
it's quite robust. Yeah, look, we've obviously, given the threats to democracy we're seeing yeah. across the Western world, we have to take comfort that there has been a smooth handover yeah. of power using a process uh, yeah. that is basically time honored. We have a parliamentary system and the parliamentary system worked. I don't think that means we should be complacent and, and, and not fear that there are still threats to that system. Yeah. Um, but you're right, this time it worked and that is a good thing. But let's not forget that across the world, whether it's Putin, some would say the Chinese, there are governments whose, frankly, their job is to prove that our system doesn't work and they want to help undermine now, it. Listen, you, you had Boris Johnson talking about uh, the importance of loyalty. You've, you know, we just heard um, Tobias Elwood talking to Paul Brand about the importance of loyalty in, in Cabinet. You, you know, we, we've both been uh, standing on the street often enough to perhaps take that with a pinch of salt. But how much chance do you think there is that the party will now unite behind its leader? Um, I think they will give her a chance. They have to because their jobs depend on it. You're, you know, the, the, the fact is very few MPs want to lose their seats in an election. Yeah. So for a period, they will rally round. But they will only rally round for as long as they think she is delivering policies that will get them re-elected. And if anything big massively goes wrong, anything big massively goes wrong, then, you know, that royalty will disappear. OK, well, we've just seen the security bollards uh, disappearing, which means the Prime Minister is close. Uh, if you've been watching this, you'll be tempted to think that this is a long journey in more ways than one. Yeah, uh, politically, a long on journey. Are we on camera or not? Uh, we go down? Uh, in the sense that Liz Truss, when she became an MP, it's very hard to meet an MP in the House of Commons who doesn't uh, probably privately dream of one day being Prime Minister. Uh, but Liz Truss, uh, can she really have thought it was a possibility? Certainly uh, she believed that she wanted to. But here she is. She has made that journey. It has been long. She's been up to see the Queen. She's been appointed the Queen's uh, 15th Prime Minister. She is now on Westminster Bridge, which is just around the corner, uh, which means that she will be sweeping in here uh, within a few moments. Now, all things uh, worth waiting for are perhaps best delayed because it heightens the sense of anticipation. And if it's she, certainly if, been a bit of drama today. Uh, yeah. and, uh, some would say a bit of comedy as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if she has been seeking to heighten the anticipation of the waiting press, then she certainly uh, succeeded. Um, but uh, it's been, a, as we mentioned earlier, fog at Aberdeen slowed everything down. Obviously, the need to go to Scotland, quite understandably, because of issues around the Queen's health and mobility, uh, meant that uh, today has not panned out in quite such a straightforward fashion as other prime ministers uh, who've taken office and just had to go down the mall uh, to Buckingham Palace. Nevertheless, she has made the journey. She has been offered the job. Uh, she has been asked to become the 15th prime minister. She's accepted. Um, and the photographers are now asking me to uh, sit down so they can get a picture over my head or shouting would be a, perhaps a more uh, appropriate description. But fair enough. They've been waiting here uh, in the rain. Uh, we're, so we're looking down the street. Uh, watching uh, the Prime Minister compete, complete these final moments uh, of a journey that she has waited her whole life to undertake, uh, that of the drive up Downing Street uh, as the new Prime Minister to face the multiple challenges of the country at this very difficult time. Robert and I were speaking uh, a short time ago of Gordon Brown who took office in similarly straightened circumstances. It wasn't, uh, let's be clear, uh, it wasn't quite as extreme as this when he took office. Very shortly after he took office, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, we, we or in, as you remember, I reported on at the time, um, you know, the banks began to fall like dominoes. Yeah. But, you know, when he arrived, it wasn't actually quite the situation started. was not as severe as this. Yeah. In terms of, a, of, of something happening as somebody comes into office, this is as bad. I arguably, I mean, Tory MPs have said this, as any conditions that we've seen since Churchill took office during the Second okay. World War. OK. Well, we've waited a long time for this moment, so let's maybe pause and watch the new Prime Minister uh, arrive in Number 10 Downing Street to address us all about the challenges that lie ahead. Oh, there we are.
Good afternoon. I have just accepted Her Majesty the Queen's kind invitation to form a new government. Let me pay tribute to my predecessor. Boris Johnson delivered Brexit, the COVID vaccine, and stood up to Russian aggression. History will see him as a hugely consequential Prime Minister. I am honoured to take on this responsibility at a vital time for our country. What makes the United Kingdom great is our fundamental belief in freedom, in enterprise and in fair play. Our people have shown grit, courage and determination time and time again. We now face severe global headwinds caused by Russia's appalling war in Ukraine and the aftermath of COVID. Now is the time to tackle the issues that are holding Britain back. We need to build roads, homes and broadband faster. We need more investment and great jobs in every town and city across our country. We need to reduce the burden on families and help people get on in life. I know that we have what it takes to tackle those challenges. Of course, it won't be easy, but we can do it. We will transform Britain into an aspiration nation with high paying jobs, safe streets and where everyone everywhere has the opportunities they deserve. I will take action this day and action every day to make it happen. United with our allies, we will stand up for freedom and democracy around the world, recognising that we can't have security at home without having security abroad. As Prime Minister, I will pursue three early priorities. Firstly, I will get Britain working again. I have a bold plan to grow the economy through tax cuts and reform. I will cut taxes to reward hard work and boost business-led growth and investment. I will drive reform in my mission to get the United Kingdom working, building and growing. We'll get spades in the ground to make sure people are not facing unaffordable energy bills and we will also make sure that we are building hospitals, schools, roads and broadband. Secondly, I will deal hands-on with the energy crisis caused by Putin's war. I will take action this week to deal with energy bills and to secure our future energy supply. Thirdly, I will make sure that people can get doctor's appointments and the NHS services they need. We will put our health service on a firm footing. By delivering on the economy, on energy and on the NHS, we will put our nation on the path to long-term success. We shouldn't be daunted by the challenges we face. As strong as the storm may be, I know that the British people are stronger. Our country was built by people who get things done. We have huge reserves of talent, of energy and determination. I am confident that together we can ride out the storm. We can rebuild our economy and we can become the modern, brilliant Britain that I know we can be. This is our vital mission to ensure opportunity and prosperity for all people and future generations. I am determined to deliver. Thank you. Well, there we have it, the new Prime Minister and her husband posing on the doorstep of number 10 before going in to begin the work. Uh, a short, sharp speech full of catchy phrases that you would expect on a day such as this, uh, turning Britain into an aspiration nation. Uh, she said, action this day and every day and three very clear priorities.
growing the economy, uh, the energy crisis uh, and the NHS as Robert and I stand up, straighten up uh, and get back in front of the camera. Uh, Robert, pretty much what we expected, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, very much in line with all the things you've been saying over the last few weeks. Uh, I was very amused, as you were, by the constant yeah. references to coping with the storm. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. assume she was just referring to the weather today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah. obviously we are facing very, very challenging times yeah. in terms of this uh, inflationary cost of living crisis yeah. uh, and you know she said she was convinced the British people would come through it she yeah. thought of admiration for the resolve of the British people but the British people are going to need some help from you know number 10 and number 11 next door there's going to have to be a lot of money spent we've talked about the 100 billion that yes. we're expecting it to announce on Thursday I was struck though and again we talked about this earlier this was um, very much the kind of Tory message that we didn't hear that often from Boris Johnson yeah. who was you know, keen on building bridges and roads and railways. She says, I want to cut taxes to reward hard work. And that is, she is a conviction politician about that. She's been talking about the need to cut public spending and taxes for years. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, she was a Liberal Democrat. When she was a Liberal Democrat, you know, as a teenager, yeah. probably not so keen on that. But, you know, in her 20s, she became a conviction Tory politician very much on the libertarian right of the party. Um, we shouldn't forget that she backed Re Remain, but the reason you know, that she is in there is because when it came to the contest, it was the Brexiters who basically backed her. Uh, and one of the most striking things about Liz Truss, and she's obviously got much better political antenna than many people who over years have underestimated mm. her, is she worked out that the way to achieve power was to recognise that in narrow political terms, there's a big argument to be made about the economics of it, mm. in narrow political terms, she'd made a mistake in backing Remain. If she wanted to have a career, she had to become a passionate Brexiter. And since that referendum, she has joined the sort of Brexit ultras. And she is now their sort of hero, so what as it she, were. So what does she want out of Brexit? I mean, what does she see as the way ahead on that? You know, is there stuff she wants to do? Is she just want to stop talking about it? So, her... Uh, plan, yeah, uh, and you know, many people will see this as you know quite a right-wing Tory plan is yeah. to cut red tape, deregulate. She, you know, the thing that she and her chancellor uh, are uh, committed to is cutting, particularly the costs on business, and that means cutting taxes and it means cutting regulation. Now, if you're on the other side of politics, you say that the problem with that kind of deregulation approach um, is that actually it, you know, in the end means that you don't protect people either financially as much or with the kind of rules that to do with things like health and safety um, and conditions at work and all the rest of it. But, you know, she is you know, as I say, a conviction, fairly old-fashioned Tory. I would expect in the course of this winter of discontent that we are facing that she will take the unions head on. I don't think that, you know, we're likely to see much compromise in these battles over pay and working mm -hmm. conditions. Indeed, you know, we know that she is signed up to making it harder for trade unions to go on strike. And again, this is all very traditional okay. Tory stuff. Now, there is a particular wing of, of you know, people who favoured Brexiters on the right who always took the view that the only way you can really prosper outside of the EU is to completely discard the so-called social pact that the yeah. EU is associated with and basically run things in what they think of as a British way, which is a much more deregulated way, many less rules and regulations on okay. businesses in particular. OK, we're just watching there, of course, the Prime Minister, after giving her speech, posing with her husband before going in and beginning the work. Now, obviously, one of the notable things about that speech is the way she talked about how her predecessor, Boris Johnson, had stood up to Russian aggression, um, as she put it. Uh, and it's very clear, I think, uh, from anyone who knows her and has followed her over the years, uh, that there is highly 
highly unlikely to have been a change uh, of policy on that front. Now, one country, obviously, given all that, where they are very closely following today's events is Ukraine. Boris Johnson's support for Ukraine, uh, absolutely critical, President Zelensky has said many times. Uh, and Liz Truss said in her speech that the UK would continue to stand up for freedom uh, around the world. Now, our global security editor, Rohit, uh, is in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. Rohit, uh, what do you think uh, the leadership there will have made of that speech? Well, it was interesting to note how many times uh, the new prime minister referred to uh, Putin, referred to Ukraine, referred to the uh, invasion, and primarily framing uh, the challenge here, not uh, simply as, an, as a global issue, but as a domestic one. She said you cannot have security at home without security uh, abroad. And uh, she's in an almost unique situation for an incoming prime minister where the big domestic issue, the cost of living crisis, and the big international issue, Ukraine, are so uh, interlinked. She has already said that she wants her first phone call to a world leader to be uh, to President Zelensky. That may well come uh, later today. And yes, people have been watching uh, the leadership contest fairly closely uh, here. Boris Johnson was a huge figure uh, here, a street named after him uh, in uh, Odessa. And uh, of course, the fear was that um, after having such a vocal supporter leave office, what might happen next? Well, the answer uh, frankly, is that there'll be almost certainly very little change in terms of what the UK does to uh, support uh, uh, the Ukrainian uh, defence. But, but the concern amongst many uh, officials in the Zelensky administration here is perhaps now less uh, about what Liz Truss does in the immediate future. Uh, her plans are fairly clear, but about what might happen after that, once uh, the cost of living crisis uh, bites, once uh, the squeeze increases on uh, domestic budgets at home, and whether the UK and us other Western allies will be able to continue supporting Ukraine uh, to the lengths that they have been over the last six or seven months. She was actually in uh, Kiev. Um, just before the invasion, a few days beforehand. We were actually with her at, at just one of the buildings beneath us, a foreign uh, ministry, uh, and she hopes uh, to return in the very near future. Rohit, is there, are there things, I mean, we know that obviously the UK has been supporting the Ukrainians' uh, military effort economically and so on. It, are, they, are the Ukrainians very clear what more they might want, potentially, in terms of hardware or kit from Liz Truss? Yeah. And are they going to get it? Uh, will they, well, I mean, they want more. They want more. Will they get it? I mean, you know, the, the, the challenge is changing all the time. Uh, the Ukrainians are on this uh, huge counteroffensive in the south of Ukraine. It's difficult for us to see precisely what's happening there. There's very restricted access uh, for journalists to witness what's happening there. And um, so the challenge is changing week by week and the demands for weapons is changing week by week. You know, what the UK has offered is dwarfed by what the Americans uh, uh, have already offered to the Ukrainian defence many, many times over. Um, I think the support... Uh, the friendship, the perceived friendship with the UK here uh, is down to the sort of perceived unequivocal nature uh, of Britain's allyship and support for the Ukrainian defence. And also tied up to perhaps with that personal friendship between President Zelensky uh, and Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Johnson. And so that perhaps explains some of those concerns about what might happen next. And it explains, too, why there's been so much interest uh, in this leadership contest. The contenders uh, were known by many people here in Ukraine, ordinary people, and the result was known as well. And people have been talking about it in the last uh, 24 hours or so to us. OK, Rohit, thank you very much indeed. Now, as we just heard from Liz Truss, she has set out her key priorities of economic recovery, energy uh, and health care. And she appeared to acknowledge the weather that has plagued Downing Street this afternoon, admitting the challenges the UK faces as she embarks upon her premiership. By delivering on the economy, on energy and on the NHS, we will put our nation on the path to long-term success. We shouldn't be daunted by the challenges we face. As strong as the storm may be, I know that the British people are stronger. 
Our country was built by people who get things done. We have huge reserves of talent, of energy and determination. I am confident that together we can ride out the storm. Well, perhaps not the world's biggest surprise, but we just hear that the US President Joe Biden has congratulated Liz Truss uh, on her appointment. I don't know whether we uh, know whether they have had a, you know, she's obviously oh, yeah. been Foreign Secretary, so I assume they, they, they don't know each other particularly well, but I presume they've met. Can I just ask you for your overall thoughts on today? They're very symbolic, these handovers, as we've discussed. We've had a somewhat entertaining afternoon, if not always in the way uh, the government would have liked. But, you know, in the end, she gave a pretty clear speech, I thought, setting out f in fairly plain terms what her priorities were going to be. No big surprise, I think, if you followed so, so the campaign. The important things to know about Liz Truss is yeah. she's tough uh, and, you know, if you are a male politician who's got, it, who's got in her way... Yeah. She's cleared you out of the way. I mean, yeah. you know, and when people in the past, and I know this from colleagues of her, when she felt that men denigrated her, she remembered that. Yeah. And, you know, she doesn't forgive. She's mm. also a conviction politician. She is a Tory in the way that Boris Johnson was not mm. a Tory. She is dead set on cutting taxes. She is dead set on sweeping away rules and regulations, as we uh, talked about. She's dead set on, you know, she's appointed, or she's appointing J Jacob Rees-Mogg, as we understand it, to be her business secretary. He has a plan, and confirmed it yesterday, to reduce headcount in the civil service by a quarter, mm. right? This is very traditional, sort of Thatcherite kind of mm. stuff. So we are going to see a change of direction. She talked a lot today about the need to get prosperity back in the UK, to get growth up, but there are only two years at most before the next election. She said yesterday she doesn't want the election for two years, but it is incredibly difficult to get out of the kind of economic predicament we are in at the moment. We're in a recession and get the growth rate going in time for the election. So she faces a big challenge. One thing that's got, got her way, though, she's definitely got a sense of humour. I don't know if you noticed, but we heard, uh, you know, somebody put on a loudspeaker, that Donnie Darko, mad world. Well, originally and, Tears you know, for Fears, and, if and, you're yeah, an 80s was, fan. And, yeah. and, absolutely. But rather than being put off, she just smiled. Yeah, and I it is, that. you know, it has yeah. been a mad world, yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, for yeah, weeks yeah. now. And, yeah. you know, so, and one, so and, you know, and, and I think one of the things that people don't understand about her is she has got a bit more humour than perhaps you would, uh, you know, expect, given her... Uh, public reputation and you know she we saw her going in with her, her partner her husband she's got two girls I assume that we don't know yet yet but I'm assuming they're all gonna live there she's got a family structure yeah. you know we're in this new era of prime ministers with young families and we haven't talked a bit about that huge social change over the last few uh, few years so okay. uh, just to be okay. clear new era New Good knows, no, goodness knows whether it's gonna be a happy ending or a horrible ending who knows all very interesting now, there we have it. In essence, uh, a new prime minister installed behind the doors of number 10. And what an intray she has to sit down, dude. Top of the to-do list is the cost of living crisis and spiralling energy bills, NHS waiting lists and social care staffing. One of the nations of this country doesn't have a functioning government and Brexit isn't quite done. Not to mention, of course, the ongoing war in Ukraine. The Queen has asked Liz Truss to form a government and she has accepted. Her first job is now to form a cabinet that will meet first thing tomorrow morning. That work begins immediately. Uh, Mary will be here with the ITV Evening News at 6.30. Uh, a lot to discuss, so do join uh, her then. I will be back at News at 10, and we will be looking at it all in detail. But for now, goodbye and thank you for watching.